Welcome to this special episode of ABH Derpcast. So it's just me, Stephen, this week. Uh, we don't have Harv and his wife have had a beautiful baby. So first off, we'd just like to wish them a very, very heartfelt congratulations on uh, the new arrival. Uh, I'll let Harv share more details on uh, that when he's ready and when he's had some family time. Uh, but for now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this opportunity to take a look back at some of the stories that we shared. So at the start of ADH Darpcast, we really didn't know what we were going to do with the podcast. We knew we wanted to tell some stories. We knew we wanted to share experiences and we wanted to explore. Uh, where we went was we told our diagnosis journeys. We've shared our Medicaid stories. We have both had ups and downs in terms of Medicaid. So I personally had to, not had to, but chose to come off uh, an SSRI. Uh, Harv had to come off Ritalin. And that's been one hell of a uh, wild ride. So go back and have a listen to those episodes. We share an awful lot of information in those. Uh, we share a lot of uh, personal stories. There's a lot of ups and downs uh, and we share some, this is quite a few hilarious moments as we kind of go through. There's a lot of personal, uh, a lot of personal sharing. There's ups, downs. Uh, we talk about like mishaps and our journey. We have a special guest. We had um, on episode four, we had Stephen Daly join us, uh, which was a fantastic conversation. Um, I highly recommend people to uh, go back and have a look at that. But tune in for uh, this episode. We're going to take a look back over some of our favorite moments from the season so far. Uh, and once we finish looking at those, uh, come back to me and we'll share what's coming next. gets sick of that because i'm well known for bringing back strays yeah and you and rachel were strays yeah. basically um and he had his core group of three friends that he still has and when he met me that grew f***ing exponentially <laughs> and he hates it like yeah. I, like we have so many different groups with so many subcategories and stuff like that and I he just like that. he's like go away just yeah, stop, yeah, yeah. stop bringing people and this is my the life. this is the other funny thing because me and graham are the grumpy bastards of the relationship yep where you and rachel are like the happy outgoing people and um, positive yeah. affirmation like yeah which is, is it's like weird that we connected in the opposite way although yeah. it probably isn't because you know you're i have a graham and you you're have a rachel, rachel. <laughs> yeah <laughs> You know? So it, on that level, it makes sense. And again, explains the sexual tension. Yeah. yeah, we never, never figured that one out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what brought us here. And like you mentioned how important it is to seek the diagnosis, but not only seeking the diagnosis, because that's great from our perspective as the diagnosed, you know, yeah. but it really needs to be um, a more open conversation. And that's what we're trying to do, you yeah. know, with this podcast and with the conversations that we're having to make it more acceptable, to have these open conversations. And if it does become more kind of widespread and acknowledged that not everybody, you know, can do an interview the same as some people, um, you know, specific 
tests or specific ways of doing things don't really work for everybody. Yeah. Um, and that if we, if we can kind of push that idea and that conceptualization out to the wider um, community, you know, maybe recruitment practices change and maybe yeah. things become easier for, uh, for people. <laughs> if, if us doing this affect even one person, if one person in an interview or one hiring manager performing an interview changes the way they think and it affects an outcome in a more positive way, I'll have, I'll, like, that's, yeah. that, like, that's immense. That, like, that's impacting <clears throat> someone's life there. And that's, like, if, if we do that once, we've done what we've set out to do, I think. I always kind of knew that there was, like, I, I kind of described it as a bit missing. <clears throat> um, there was something that didn't quite click. It was <clears throat> like a jigsaw piece just wasn't there. Um, and for years, it's funny you mentioned about autism. Um, there for years I thought it was autism and I thought I was autistic because there's a quite strong vein of autism running through my family there's several family members that have different varying degrees of autism um, so for years I just kind of accepted that there was some sort of neurodiverse yeah. something um, and just kind of developed coping mechanism and just kind of dealt. Uh, I never really looked into any kind of formal diagnosis. And I think like when you say about the depression and when you were a teenager, you were going to do it and then just changed your mind. Yeah. Um, it's similar to that. I think I kind of decided against a formal diagnosis because, like in my younger years because I was kind of afraid of them telling me that I was quote unquote normal. Yeah, uh, that there wasn't anything like formal wrong with me, and wrong is the wrong word, but there wasn't any kind of neurodiversity. Yeah, and I was just lazy, or I just didn't have the same coping skills that other people had, and that was just something I had to deal with. So that kind of was something I just accepted that like there was something missing, and I just had to deal with it. Then, as I was, I was in my thirties. And approaching my 40s and we made the decision to expand our family um, and as we were kind of doing that I decided that I needed to kind of take a bit more responsibility for what was going on um, and there was a, like many 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 factors in this decision but one of the main ones was that for all of my life I've had a fear of driving okay. um, anyone who kind of knows me will be very aware of that like Graham, my husband, always had to be the main driver or when I did start to learn to drive in my 30s that it was a very stoppy, starty, not very focused process at all. And I did everything in my power to get out of it and absolutely hated the whole process um, and would like sometimes leave the car shaking wow. with fear and just absolutely hated the whole thing. Um, so I went to a GP and talked about that initially. Um, and we, I was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder or generalized anxiety disorder um, and was medicated on that. And that made a massive difference, like huge change in my life um, after the loading dose process, mm. uh, which again, something we'll talk about during the medication episode. Um, but there was still it, like it fixed some things, but yeah. it didn't click fully. Um, so there were still some issues that were that I was noticing that again, I just kind of accepted and just dealt with. Um, I'd gotten a diagnosis, so I was like, "That's that should be me done. Why am I not happy? Why am I? Why am I still having these these kind of these things?" So I was just kind of like, "Yeah, it, it's definitely autism. It's definitely autism." And there was one day, and I don't remember what the tipping point was, but I was in one room and Graham was in another room, and we were texting. And I said something to him about being autistic. And he sent me a screenshot of two lists of symptoms. So, it, sorry, I'll go back a little bit further. Yeah. People have said that I have ADHD for a long time, but I always just ignored it. I've okay. said that it was, I've had friends who've said I've, I have ADHD for years. Right. And I always just kind of ignored it um, and said, no, it's autism. It's definitely autism. Autism's in the family. Um, so then Graham, I think he just got frustrated and he sent me a screenshot of two 
like lists of like kind of like checklists okay yeah, one yeah. was autism and the other one was adhd and i was like oh i have none of this one i have all of that and one. did you know which list was which at this time i, I did okay. but it was it was still kind of like almost like a watershed moment where it was just like oh yeah oh i've been saying this wrong and it was weird like i almost had like a sense of loss yeah at the like the identity that i had assigned myself but also like a feeling of renewal because i was like oh no this is this fits me better and it's a complete match and the jigsaw clicked into place and yeah like, yeah oh and that was so at that point there was no uh there was no dealing with it it was just like yeah no i have to go and get a diagnosis okay, this, is, yeah, this yeah. has to happen now because i need to formalize this so i can actually do something about it <clears throat> but um what actually led you to like you said about growing up in North County, Dublin and things, and uh, what, what actually led you to explore a diagnosis? Like, I know it was fairly late in life, but yeah. did you have any idea in early life or anything? I'm so glad you asked, right? And looking back now, I could see that it was probably there in different ways all throughout childhood, all throughout kind of being a teenager in school, college, whatever else. But actually what led me to it was, and actually I was, I was speaking to... um this is like it sounds like i'm name dropping like clang i was uh, speaking to a journalist from the uh, the independent about this whole area as well they did a, a feature piece on this like you know and for me the big thing that kind of ticked a lot of boxes was TikTok, yeah. right so like you know and and you know people think oh it's just where you go to learn dances and like see what see what the kids are up to but having gotten into TikTok, i found my way to adhd TikTok. you know through whatever and just listening to the way people spoke about the symptoms they had or the things they experienced i started to piece a lot of it together and like my partner was very um very supportive of all this so so my partner grew up in canada where things seem to work a little bit better than they do in ireland and we'll just leave it at that because we can go on a whole other podcast about that but you know she would have a very kind of open way of kind of diagnosing these things or, or like you know it's just a bit more clued in or a bit more together it's a bit more concrete and she was like yeah 200 percent, you have adhd for sure and like go and do the 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 test or the the assessment or whatever else and again it was one of those things that i put on the long finger for the longest was time was that early what? in the relationship Stephen, or was that kind of later down the line so early in the relationship she probably twigged that hang on there's something not right here as in like and and again like you know it's pros and cons and i'm sure you lads have the same where there are both good and bad parts to this thing. And like, there are some amazing skills you get from it. And like, you know, I was talking to a, another friend of mine who I actually don't know if he has a diagnosis, but he, he works in the, the creative industries as well. You know, he's a writer for TV and various bits and pieces, but if he hasn't diagnosed it, he, he is undiagnosed and he's kind of just gone along with, you know, watching videos like we have and kind of went, yeah, I have it without actually taking the step of getting an official one. But as he put it, you don't see too many accountants with ADHD. So <laughs> like there is a whole side of it that brings this wonderful, and I want to say madness, like, you know, it brings this madness, this energy or this thing, you know, where, where you've got this creative spark or whatever in you, but then it also brings all the bad bits. So she was able to kind of look at that and go, yeah, hang on, there's something not right here. And, you know, it kind of lead me towards those videos and be like, see this here, that's you, that's you there, that's you. And the more I watched it, the more I was like, yeah, ho holy God, this is me, like, you know. And then from there, I just kind of worked out, you know, I put it on the long finger for ages about getting a diagnosis, you know, but I eventually just took the plunge last year. And yeah, like I spoke to, um, so I went through a company and people ask this all the time, where did you go or how did you go about it? And I'm sure you guys get it all the time yeah, too. Absolutely, because, yeah. you know, obviously you can go to your GP and you can start the whole kind of public health route that takes forever to go with it. I ended up going privately and I went to a company called um, Doctor Online. Yeah who do like a three-step process. Now it's an expensive enough process and I always yeah. say that to anyone, but well worth it. Like, so you do two consultations with a psychologist and then one with a psychiatrist and like within, you know, actually, and I was like laughing, like so funny, typical ADHD, I scheduled an appointment with the psychologist and forgot that it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> like totally like went out of my head times dates everything completely even though i had done it and spent so much money on it the guy rang me and was like i'm sitting here waiting for you where are you why aren't you doing this like and then when i explained he was like i don't even need to do anything else with you i can already <laughs> tell this is gonna be this is gonna be good um, the thing is like when you're building on knowledge in a kind of consecutive way when like let's say one leads to two leads to three leads to four mm. let's say life happens and you miss two yeah and you go one three four what happens with me is when i get to three 
I'll be like, I missed something. I don't understand. Yeah, I'm the same. Then I start to feel overwhelmed. And when I start to feel overwhelmed, rather than reach out and try and figure out where that gap is, I tend to shut down. Mm. And I'm just like, I can't do this. I but do you know you've missed too? Do you know that's... Because I feel like I'm the same. But if I know that I've missed... If I know there's something missing, then yeah. I'll be able to go and figure it out. But if I don't know... Yeah. If I don't understand why I'm not grasping the concept, yeah. or I don't know that there's a, a, a missing piece of information or something... If I know how to then get I'll that lose. slice back, then I'll be fine. I'll go figure it out and plug that into whatever. Um, if I don't... Mm. And that that's often, oftentimes I won't look back and try and figure it out. I'll go straight to just blaming myself. Mm. I go, I, I just don't understand this. This isn't for me. This isn't something that I'll be able to understand. And I just put like a shell around myself and withdraw from the information and shut myself down. But if I go back and go, just look at, here's two. It's clearly labeled as two. Yeah, yeah. Plug two into three and you'll be fine. Um, I'll be able to pick up, but mm. more often than not, I'll just be like, "Nah, it's this isn't for someone of me who is obviously of lesser intellect." Yeah. Um, which often isn't the case. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because then, if I do go and figure it out and do it, I understand it in a way that's different to other people on the course. Mm. And I remember there was a there was a time on the course where everyone was like, "We can't figure this out. We don't know this. It's so complex. It's so confusing." And I'm like. What am I not doing? And I went that way. I yeah. instantly went to blame that's, myself. That's something that I've experienced an awful lot. You know, if the majority of people are doing something different to you, even yeah. though you you feel like you've gotten the right thing, yeah, um, then it's an automatic. Oh well, then I've done it wrong. I've done it wrong. Yeah, like, they're finding this hard. I'm finding this really easy. Yeah. Obviously, I'm the one who's wrong. And I remember our lecturer calling me out and being like. Stephen did this in a really different way to everyone else. Mm. And it was a roundabout way, but technically ingenious because it eliminated this, eliminated this, and eliminated this. And I was like, is that good or bad? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, but uh, it was just the way I had tangented into the correct answer. Yeah. But um, yeah, like if I can plug back in the missing piece, it'll work fine. Yeah. But, so yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue you a challenge, okay? Because okay. I want to change your, your perspective on mindfulness because I know how powerful it can be from my own experience. Um, so your challenge is there's an app called Insight Timer. Okay, Insight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T, Timer. And you can download that. And in it, there's a seven-day kind of tutorial learning to meditate type thing, program. Um, and it's very short, you know, I think they're kind of between three and seven or 15 minutes. Um, there's one for each day. So you do one every day for seven days. Um, <clears throat> you kind of learn about what meditation, mindfulness meditation is supposed to be, what it's not supposed to be, um, little tips and tricks to help you to do it. And it's in those little kind of tiny bite-sized chunks rather than the 30 minute sit downs where you're you're setting yourself up to fail and be pissed off with it. So give that a go, right? Try okay. it. And if you're going through it and you feel, okay, I've done day one and day two, I feel like day three is a bit too much for me. Go and do day two again or day one again. Mix and match, you know, and then build yourself up to day three, day four, day five, however you need to, whatever feels comfortable for you. But remember, the key thing is just let it happen, okay? Let the thoughts come and let them go. Bring yourself back to your breath or whatever the guy it says and don't judge yourself about it because people who have been doing it for years and decades, they still get that monkey brain. They still get that situation where they get distracted and they get taken out of their, their presentness. Um, the only difference is they know not to be judgmental about it and can bring themselves back uh, to the present situation. So give that a go and okay. keep it posted. And other people who are listening, give it a go as well. Yeah, I'm like literally about to download it right now. <laughs> nice. So uh, there's baby monitor popping up for my uh, my squirrel of a child. Um, yeah, I'm going to install that right now. It's free. I can see, which is nice. Um, 
I think, okay, I would suggest then that any of our, our listeners who want to do that as well, I think what we should do is link that app, both the Google Play Store and um, App Store links for that yeah. app because I think there's a lot of people like me who will have misconceptions or like preconceived notions about what mindful mindfulness is. So, yeah, I invite in the same way as you have challenged me, I challenge other people, people who are listening to this to also try that and see yeah. if it makes any difference because I, whatever helps, I'll try, I'll like, I'll try anything once, you know? Yeah. So yeah, absolutely going to do that. Thank you for the challenge and thank you for the suggestion and for the insight. Nice one. Nice one. I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a Jehovah's witness for mindfulness. I've, I've let myself down for a long time now by not practicing. Um, yeah. even though I know how much benefit I get from it, I just, no matter how much I want to do it, I always find that there are other things more pressing that I need to spend my time on. Um, which makes a lot of sense, you know, in the, in the environment that I live in, there's always things yeah. that we want, there's always people to talk to or whatever it is. But like we've spoken about before the gym, it's one of those self care things that, you know, it's important, you know, you should do it, you know, the benefits are there just have to make time for it. And that's, it's probably a challenge I need to take on myself to, to, to start spending more time self caring in that way. Yeah, actually, do you know what? That's exactly right. Because we're talking to you as if you are, uh, um, an ambassador of mindfulness, but you've just admitted there that you don't devote as much time as you want to. So then I reissue your challenge back to you Who to knows do the same so. thing and do uh, yeah, uh, to do the exact oh. same challenge as well. Make time every day yeah. to, to practice mindfulness. Yeah. And it's especially important, like not, not important, but for me, it would be especially important in these circumstances, you know, where overwhelm and anxiety are cropping up, where stress is through the roof. You know, time is kind of running away from you. It's in those moments, especially where being present and taking a step back allows you to kind of look at things in perspective. Um, you know, I'm up the wall with everything that I need to do, but at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world if I don't get an A or if I submit something late or, you know, any of these types of things, the real situation is is my family safe? Is my family happy? And that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, those are the real important things at the end of the day. And you, you kind of do need a, a nudge when you're in these situations to be able to say, Hey, look, Jesus, just g give yourself a break. Like take a step back. Does that it's you're, you're on a kind of runaway train, but like you just step off if you really want yeah. to. Yeah. I'm inspired. So do you want to tell people why your brain is like a box of frogs that's been run over by a truck and I have been absolutely dreading each and every interaction with you for the last while? Yeah, so it's been a, I feel, I was thinking about this the other day, okay, right? I feel like we need to change the name of the show to the Harris Had a Shitty Week show. <laughs> I was literally every single episode starts with, so how's your week been? And then it's like me going on a rant tirade of all the shit things that are going on. All the um, insurmountable problems that you seem to struggle upon. I actually used the word insurmountable in my email to one of my lecturers. So okay. bang on there. So yeah, um, we talked last week, I think about college and how things are just kicking off. Everything's so super crazy and yeah. Uh, it's, it's just like a, a huge tsunami of work all coming, you know, to it, coming to a head at the exact same time at the end of the semester. So last week I was coming up to the, the very final week of semester two before the exams were due. And there was, I think I mentioned last week, loads, loads of deliverables that needed to be done. Um, and unfortunately on the Monday of the last week. 
I had to go to my doctor's. Um, we had moved from direct care from my psychiatrist to shared care, which is a, a thing in Ireland where they do half care with your GP and half care with your uh, psychiatrist. So you essentially only have to go to your psychiatrist like once a year or once every six months instead of, you know, much more regularly. Um, yeah, for me, it's, so it's every six months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we had agreed on my last meeting with my psychiatrist that we would do that. Got an email or a text from the uh, the GP to say, look, you need to come in for a, a checkup, blah, blah, blah. So we organized a BP, 24-hour BP monitor, which I'd never had. I didn't find it, you know, too annoying. Everybody was saying it's going to be a pain in the ass, you know, you're not going to like it. It goes off every half an hour and wakes you up all through the night, but I found it okay. Yeah, for anyone who annoying. doesn't know, it's basically a box that's attached to you with a blood pressure cuff attached to your arm. And yeah, it it gives regular blood pressure readings. It's a halter monitor, it's called. Yeah, so it's it basically goes off every half hour. And then when you're, I think, 11 o'clock is switched over to every hour. Um, but yeah, it wasn't too bad, except for when I was writing my reports and stuff for trying to code. And then every half an hour, you're like, oh, shit, that's another half an hour gone. It's almost like a, you know, a countdown clock. Beep, beep, uh, where... Yeah, it's like, oh, no, that's another half an hour gone out of the time I have left to get these things finished. So it's almost like someone's, you know, standing behind you with a whip. Get get it, get it done. You're, you're losing time. But yeah, that happened on Monday. So I was really productive on Monday, even with the cuff uh, and got a really good bit of work done on one of the major project deliverables. Then Tuesday comes around up to the doctor in the morning uh, to see how things are going and got the, you know, just absolutely heart wrenching uh, news that my BP was too high to continue on my meds and that I essentially had to come off them immediately. Now I hadn't taken them yet on Tuesday morning because I take them kind of more towards the late morning. Um, so I didn't even have any in me at that stage. But yeah, he's, he's essentially saying there's too high a risk of cardiac problems if you don't come off your meds immediately and don't take them. Um, and then four weeks time, come back, we'll do another BP monitor for 24 hours and see how it is and go from there. Um, okay. And I was uh, legit near, near tears when he said that, like, you know, you can't yeah. just clear me away because the stress, the stress and pressure of trying to get everything done is enough on its own without now basically being told you don't have the one thing that actually helps you to get all these things done anymore. And you just have to do it on your own, which you've struggled with your whole life and actually have kind of an AB test of a master's you've tried to do before and failed that because of the ADHD. And because of the struggles of being able to focus for assignments and stuff like that. So it was a very rough, rough, rough Tuesday. Um, it's literally everything that we have built with this podcast was because we were <laughs> seeking discomfort. We were uncomfortable and we did it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, you look at us a year ago, there's no way I'd be talking to anybody <laughs> for this amount of time. My wife's yeah. always kind of telling me, you talk to Stephen more than you talk to me. And it's but true. That's, because, that's the unbridled know. sexual tension as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Between my wife and myself, we can't talk to each other. <laughs> I know what you <laughs> meant. It's all, it's all for me. <laughs> no, no, it's all, it's, all, it's all for me. I know. I, I yeah. know it's not what it is. And I will, um, I'll fight anyone who says otherwise. But yeah, um, shit, now I can Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like we were, um, this is the, where's the meds? Somebody this sent is me the me. sexual tension. I've, I, I've distracted you with, <laughs> with, with that again. Sorry. Oh, God's sake. Close your mouth, Roberts. <laughs> um, Creates a better seal. Yeah. <laughs> <For fuck's sake. laughs> you see, this is, this is a hostile work environment. That's what this is. I know. Where's HR? Oh my God. Anyway, going go back to what we were originally talking about. So, yes, we have seeked discomfort, but I don't think we've necessarily seeked it in that kind of way. We had like a vision in our minds of what we wanted to do and what we wanted to pursue and achieve. And rather than 
seeking the discomfort actively. We kind of passively came across it along the long and winding road of creating stuff. And yeah. rather than shit ourselves and turn our tails and leg it down the road, we faced it kind of head on and supported each other through the dodgy bits. And we shot ourselves anyway, wiped ourselves off yeah. and kept going. Exactly. And we're still doing that. Yeah. <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. That's the thing. We've, uh, we've just kept going. We felt those shitty feelings of, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then we did it anyway. So I wouldn't have it any other way and I wouldn't have anyone else beside me doing it. So hooray for us. Ah, oh, shucks. You know, I'm emotionally barren, so. Yeah. I'm not even going to pretend to to feel something from that. So, yeah, this is actually something else. I have been trying to get a hug. Now, this man, in my experience, we used to live fairly close together. And we used to be in each other's house fairly commonly. And I couldn't leave the house without getting a hug. And that was always instigated by him. So... I have been trying since we set up this podcast. Is this facts? I didn't notice. This is well, facts. Obviously, yes. I knew it at the time, but I have no memories of these things. But... Yeah, I used to give yourself and Rachel a hug, and actually, it'd I be thought you your fascination with hugs was that you never got one from me. That's what I no, thought. No, I used to get them all the time. Oh, okay. You used to be a very huggy young man. Now you're just a bitter, grumpy young man. I was always um, a bitter, grumpy young man. I'm obviously just living out there in the fresh air, kind of changed things. Yeah, I was, uh, it was I'm going to say it was the, my influence, but uh, <laughs> the yeah, I've been, for the past six months, since we've been kind of spending a lot more time around each other, I've been uh, requesting hugs and my requests have gone unfulfilled. So, Okay, yes. here's a challenge for you. Put a put a milestone down on the table, and when we hit that mile, it has to be a reasonable milestone. I will give you the biggest hug that you've ever received, and you have to keep the, you have to keep your hands very very well visible. They can be visible and still inappropriate, but I think you mean above the the top. Yeah, of... let's keep them definitely. You know, at least four foot from the ground. I can work with that. Um, okay, I'll tell you what, when we hit a thousand subscribers, you owe me a thousand subscribers on YouTube, you mm. owe me that one. I think that's too small. I don't think it is. I think it's too small. Like I was looking at the other app that kind of helps you figure out YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah. And the original goal, I think is like 150 subscribers. Then the second goal is like. 300 then it goes to two or 500 and from 500 it jumps up to 4600 so i think realistically you're looking at 4600 we're now let's split the difference we'll go 2000 okay deal okay 2500 what are we going to do when we're talking about that <laughs> you, can't <have> <laughs> you, can't, you can't you can't just live well enough alone we're going oh to need a, they'll be for the, um, Patreon. We'll have to get that set up for them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. I think anyway, we'll leave it there. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. That's, where that's were we? What were we talking about? I like um, it, though. I like it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good goal. 2,500. It's, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like a constantly moving goal. It's like, so, I think we talked about this about like my grades in college and stuff like that. You're happy. You have an idea of what you'd be happy with in your head. And then when you get to that, it's like, I'm so not happy with this. I need more. I need more. I need more. It's like a constant train. So yeah, I am a very crazy. And once we get there, we'll be like, this is shit. Like we yeah, need to get more, more. And more and more. I'm a very emotionally needy person. So I need that hug. So I'm going to implore everyone who's listened to this. <laughs> It's not going to cost you anything. Just just press that little subscribe button. Steve While you're at it, feel free to like and comment. There, the custom people subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. Yeah, no, just just you know, bring me bring me one little click closer to to my dreams. Yes. Those 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 squishy hugs that I used to get back in the day <laughs> that I've been longing for for so long. And squishier now as well. The squishier. Now. We've also learned that when we're doing our eardrops. We don't send photos while we have droplets of milk in our beard. Rachel was like 
laughing at me, but any time I eat, have cereal, I don't eat cereal an awful lot because I'm not really much of a fan of milk anymore, but um, I always get milk in my beard, regardless of the situation or what I'm eating <laughs> or whatever it is. Every single time there is milk in my beard from the get-go. And uh, <laughs> she came over to do my eardrops. Or I, I think I went over to her to do, to do my eardrops and she's doing them. I have to tilt my head like completely sideways. She's like, what? Why is there milk in your beard? I'm like, there's always milk in my beard. It's just like common knowledge. I can't believe you've been my wife for, for this long and we've been together for 13 years and you don't know about milky beard. <laughs> but then no. stupidly, stupidly, Harvey sends the picture to Stephen saying, oh, I just got my eardrops uh, done and I feel like shit. And of course I have a milky beard and Stephen runs straight to his bedroom to enjoy that picture. It's it's firmly logged and lodged uh, in an image repository or bank of some <laughs> description, uh, we oh might say. Um, I got to show the picture here, but uh, I think what we should do is when this is being edited, I think we should have the picture on screen. For I don't think that's to, reasonable. I think, I think it's incredibly I think. I think that amounts to some some sort of abuse. Where's that HR? <laughs> Milk. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> That's a new level of uh, of of personal sharing now. I, don't <laughs> I f often forget to eat and drink and all that kind of stuff. When but, you say that to people, they're like, "How are you, fat footman?" Yeah, <laughs> you know? because you binge then. Exactly. Like, I haven't eaten all day. Now I need to get, you know, I'll, I'll I order a seven takeaway. Chickens. Yeah, I'll order a takeaway. I'll, while I'm waiting for the takeaway to come, I'll have a packet of crisps and a bar. Yeah. And then when you're finished your takeaway, I'll have a pint of ice cream. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all r right before bed because you haven't eaten all day. Yeah. Quick side note, what's your takeaway order? Depends where I'm going. Chinese. Chinese. I'm a very bland person. Okay. So like I, like a five and one. Do like a five and one. I'm a, like really intolerant to garlic, so I never knew that. I love shredded chicken. Oh, I do like, but chicken. I can't have garlic on it for our non Irish. So, so plain, like for our non Irish listeners and watch watchers, yeah. What's a five and one? A five and one. So, in my Chinese, a five and one is so well, let's start with a three and one, right? Yeah, Go so back to basics. You've got rice, yeah, curry sauce. Yeah. I usually get barbecue sauce, I don't like curry, and chips. You don't like curry, no. In a tray. <laughs> we can just stop recording. This well, is, this, I mean, this is over. There's, there's. I literally have curry stains on me right imagine now. Imagine a list of all of the things that normal people eat. Mm -hmm. None of them are on my on my list of things that I eat. Wow. I literally eat fuck all. Like, okay. I'm so picky. Brains I'm not really too, plain. Not as too well. bad as I used to be. Um, I've kind of experimented and moved out of my comfort zone with it. But uh, another ADHD the thing, eating the same thing all the time. Yeah, that's um, true. But yeah, so. Sauce, rice, and chips in a tray, three and yeah. one, four and one. Sauce, rice, chips, and maybe chicken, beef. Typically or... like chicken balls. In your in your place? Most places, chicken balls. Yeah, really? Four and one, yeah. Okay. Or they do shredded chicken. Yeah. So in that's the four and one. I've also got it with chicken fried rice, which is nice. Chicken, okay. So chicken fried rice, chips, and it sauce. Might, that's called a, a special tray or something, I think. Okay, right. So then the five and one has the chicken balls and the shredded chicken in it. Both? Yeah. Okay. You get like two chicken balls and a bit of ch shredded None chicken. None of this is in any way Chinese. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I get sometimes. I like chicken fried rice as well. Yeah. Very plain, good. like. Yeah. yeah. But like, ch that that's my journey. I don't eat any like Chinese food. No, no I do. I yeah. tend, like when I'm ordering... Graham's very plain. He'll get like chicken balls, chips and curry sauce. Yeah. And that's like, there, there's no deviation. Yeah. From yeah. That. Um, I'll go, to, tend to go to like the chef, chef's recommendation section. Well, la di da. And, and pick out, go like, ooh, tin gin duck. That looks nice. Okay. Yeah. Or like, uh, char sui, char sui, char sui, something like that. Are you having um, a stroke? <laughs> <laughs> it's a pork thing. Um, right. Pork belly. And it's very, very nice. Um, I tend, I, like, I... You don't I, give a shit, you just eat anything. I'll put that in my mouth. Yeah. Well, um, we know that, yeah. Except for tomatoes. 
Tomatoes are the fucking devil. Why do you not like tomatoes? Um, I think it's a texture thing. Texture. Because I like tomato sauce. Yeah. I like in pasta, like I'll, I don't like salsa because it's too tomato bitty. It's tomato <laughs> Um, uh, But like actual tomatoes. Yeah. Cooked raw devil. Yeah. What um, about onions? I used to, like the texture of onions used to make me gag. Yeah. But as I've gotten older, I've kind of been okay with it. Raw onions are still a hell no. Crispy onions. Crispy onions are the bomb. Fucking, I fucking hate onions. Best thing in the world. But crispy onions, because yeah. of the texture. Or onion rings. I like onion rings. I don't like onion rings. I, 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 I don't like, like onion, onion rings, rings on a burger. I don't like onion rings. No, go fuck yourself. Um, no, onion rings are nice on a burger. Right. How do we, how do we get here? Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> fucking talking about our Chinese orders. Um, I fucking hate tomatoes. Yeah, so this is an ADHD podcast about tomatoes. <laughs> Sing a song. Sing a song. <laughs> so what about you then? Are you fully off your, I want to say Lexapro? Lexapro, yeah. I haven't taken Lexapro in a while. Yeah. Um, there's definitely been an adjustment period. Um, there's been managing my emotions has become something I have to consciously be aware of um in I'm, what way fi- um i find that when i'm just on ritalin it's almost like the lexapro is tempering the mood affecting parts of ritalin um and when i'm just on ritalin that's a bit more magnified so i have okay. to be a bit more aware of the potential mood swings and mitigate it and kind of breathe a bit more basically and bring myself back down i'm finding i can i'm back to when i was quite quick to anger and quite quick to being very reactionary yeah um like not in any kind of like i'm not exactly like smashing glasses off a wall or anything yeah. like that but i'm this is bullshit kind of fast um but it's like it's okay it's manageable it's fine it's not like it's not like that's in any way debilitating. I just have to be aware <laughs> of how I'm feeling, you know? Uh, yeah. And when I react to something, I have to kind of try and make myself take a step back and go, am I reacting to this or am I reacting to this? You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And is it just triggering like a sense of injustice? Um, which I am quite hyper aware of at the minute. And um, because of how I'm reacting to things and I'm trying to see if my reactions to things are legitimate or if I'm just reacting, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so all in all, I uh, like but that. The thing is I was on Lexapro to manage anxiety um, and none of the discussions of coming off it have been around anxiety. Like that hasn't <laughs> peaked or there hasn't been any, um, haven't been any anxiety peaks or any uh, stressors around that side of things at all. Um, yeah. So I think Ritalin is managing the <clears throat> that side of it really well. Um, yeah. I'm I haven't had any any panic attacks or anything like that, or any kind of anxiety attacks uh, coming off Lexapro, which has been pretty sweet because they weren't great. I didn't have panic attacks per se. I would have it was more like big anxiety attacks. Um, like I wouldn't have had the like the like heightened uh, heart rate. Can't really do anything. It was more slow burner than that. Like I'd talk myself out of situations. Like if I knew I had a big drive coming up, mm. I'd make excuses and try and create a situation where I wouldn't have to do the drive. Yeah. yeah or yeah. like, and it would just be constantly in my head all the time. So less panic attacky, more con- uh, more constant. Um, I haven't had any of that. That has been quite nice. And I'm more able to not get in my head. So like, I used to be very procrastinating. Like, let's say, like me and Graham were just on holiday. And the big thing for me was always like going into new places. And I'd always talk myself out of being the first person to go into a new place or Mm. find reasons to not go and stuff like that. Whereas now I'm very much, ooh, let's go here and just walking in. You know, and that, not I was exactly the same. Home. I was exactly the same with that. Um, yeah. Like when we were in Rome for our honeymoon and stuff, usually I'd be like the one who wants to stay in the hotel, you know, yeah. 
maybe just go to the restaurant in the hotel because I'm, you know, have this kind of subconscious fear <laughs> of, of strange places. But in Rome, we walked all over the place. We didn't, you know, we had no bones about going anywhere. But you, you mentioned the, um, the not being in your head. Like that's the one bit that I miss most about, yeah. I think the Ritalin, because I'm always in my head now. Like you have no space. Yeah. I, I see it in you when, when we're talking about things, even when we're talking about simple things like editing and stuff like that, mm. you, it's like, you find it hard to let the little things go. It's like you're almost obsessing on small details or like constantly on, you know, whereas I'm yeah. like, oh, let's do this, throw it up, done. You're like, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And this is wrong. You know, like, whereas yeah, those things... that perfectionism has come back because the yeah. little voice inside my head has come back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can, that's, that's probably been the, for what we're doing. That's been one of the big challenges trying to get yeah. you past that not everything needs to be perfect. You know what I mean? And it's funny because uh, I had, I've had this conversation with a few different people, you know, friends who was starting a business and a friend who was, um, can't remember what they were doing, but it was a similar thing. And I had, having gone through this process for the podcast, you know, where we realized let's get it 80% of the way and then it's fine to put out. And yeah. I had this conversation with these people and gave them that advice from the experience. But now obviously it's ricocheted back onto me. Um, yeah. with the ch change in circumstances, but let's see how you get on doctor wise. See if that, um, what's wrong with her. What's wrong with her. Let's see what, <laughs> yeah. In the next issue of what's wrong with her, <laughs> things will be right with her. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's where things are. Um, nice. so that's the story so far. And that's a wrap on season one of ADH Sharpcast. But this is by no means the end of the journey for uh, Harv and I. We are currently planning uh, some new things. We're planning on what our next steps are going to be. And we have plenty of topics to talk about in season two. So we're planning those at the moment. We're discussing a couple of other things, a few other types of projects we want to explore. I want to explore. I've got uh, one that I'm planning, a solo one um that's it works it's something i've been planning for a little while so that's going to be coming soon i know harv's planning a solo one as well uh so keep an eye out for those we'll be talking about those on our uh platforms on, on TikTok, on instagram uh on youtube so uh keep an eye out for those announcements as well but season will be back soon and um, we're discussing a couple of other things we're toying toying around with the idea of a rebrand um, so as always, let us know what you think, uh, let us know any comments you have, uh, thanks Lillian, for joining us on the journey so far, but please do stay with us and we'll be back soon. But for now, uh, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, give us any and all feedback and, uh, thanks for joining us so far. So that's it.